Okay, everyone. How are you? It's Steve. I'm Steve Clemens. I help run the American Strategy Program here at the New America Foundation, and I publish the blog, The Washington Note. We were waiting for uh, it to hit 1215 because we're joined by lots and lots of people watching online right now. I want to thank all of you for making it through the snow here and to talk about a very modest topic, how to run the world. Um, this is Parag Khanna's new book, How to Run the World, Charting a Course to the Next Renaissance. And... Uh, he starts with the provocative notion in part that we are entering a period that's somewhat like the medieval age. Uh, and I look forward to, to, to both wrestling with Parag about this and hearing him articulate, um, as he does brilliantly, I, I think, uh, his view about where he sees global governance and the big challenges of the day going. Of course, Parag is a senior research fellow here at the American Strategy Program. Um, we're very proud of his work. He's the author of the influential book, Second World Empires and Influence in the New Global Order. It was published by Random House in 2008. Uh, he was a senior geopolitical advisor to the U.S. Special Operations Forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and I say that with great pride because given that role, he was still a signer of our somewhat provocative uh, 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 Afghanistan study group. We had a great dinner last night. And uh, uh, so he's been on both sides, both the side as was part of the machine uh, uh, of what's going on over there and a side of the critique uh, of U.S. foreign policy. And I admire people who can both work in government and then get enough distance and, frankly, backbone to be able to speak uh, candidly and publicly about their concerns. Uh, he was named one of Esquire's 75 most influential people in the 21st century, uh, one of 15 individuals featured in Wired Magazine's Smart List. Uh, he's one of the real big stars in the Young Leaders uh, of the World Economic Forum. Uh, he's done shows on TED, and Parag is just everywhere now, so we're very happy to get you know a part of his time here uh, at the New America Foundation, and he is uh, one of these new media, I'm a new media type, but he's sort of putting me to shame, but does Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. So uh, without further ado, help welcome Parag, and I look forward to getting uh, to a Q&A and discussion on some very important issues uh, with his new book. And congratulations on it. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Good afternoon. Wherever I am in the world, Steve, you know I belong at New America. So it's great to be, be here at home. Uh, New America was an instrumental and very supportive of my first book and very much the case again uh, with this second one. And yes, I did title it How to Run the World. And it was, uh, it's, been, it's been in the making for quite a while. The, the last sent the, my first book, The Second World, was about empires, geopolitics, rising powers, and so forth. But the last sentence of the book was, diplomacy is an art. And this is very much a sequel, because I'm going to betray the answer right away. We run the world through diplomacy. This neglected term that is just uh, used almost as an epithet or an afterthought so much in uh, discussions of world politics today is, in fact, the one-word answer for how we have run the world, how we attempt to run the world, how we should run the world. But the question is, what kind of diplomacy, how, who, what, when, where, why? That's what I'm going to get into today. We have a lot of mistaken assumptions about diplomacy. The first and biggest of those mistakes is to conflate it with international interstate relations. Uh, we think of the Westphalian world as the world of diplomacy. That is a simply historical inaccuracy. Diplomacy is, as the joke goes, the second oldest profession. Uh, it long predates the state system. It uh, survives through it, and it will long outlast uh, the state system. As we move into what many already call a post-Westphalian world, when we talk about city states and corporations, NGOs, religious groups, uh, activist movements and their roles in world politics, we are talking about a post-Westphalian world. And yet we are saying that all of those actors play a greater and greater role in diplomacy. And so this post-Westphalian world actually looks a lot like the pre-Westphalian world, and that was, in fact, the Middle Ages of a thousand years ago. So the 21st century might, to some degree, look like a globalized, steroids-filled version of the 12th century. Now, another reason why going back a thousand years is an interesting analogy today is not least because we have this panoply of actors that are influential in diplomacy, again, whether it's private armies or terrorist groups or humanitarians and universities, but also because of the geopolitical structure of the world. That was a truly multipolar age. If you think about what the world looked like a thousand years ago, 
when China, the Song Dynasty, uh, India, represented by, in, in this case, the Chola Empire, uh, the Abbasid Cal Caliphate, and uh, and uh, other, uh, the Byzantine Empire, and so forth. That was a truly, Eurasia was a multipolar landscape. It was Europe that, of course, in the period of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, was, th was the weakest uh, of, of those actors. And hence, the notion of the Middle Ages has a very negative connotation in the West. But stri strictly, factually speaking, a thousand years ago, the world was multipolar in this way. And it is so again. Hence, when people talk about the emerging multipolarity in the 21st century and they say, oh, it's like 19th century Europe, that's narrow, that's Eurocentric, that's inadequate. And in fact, it's quite frankly irrelevant to understanding the kind of multipolarity that we have in the 21st century. So in geopolitics, when we're always looking for, when we're trying to forecast what is the next world order, or, you know, what is the next geopolitical structure, we say, well, look at how the global hegemon has migrated from east to west from China across Eurasia and Italy and Holland and France and Britain and uh, and then the United States. Well, then you just turn the globe one more uh, rotation and you have China again. Does Isn't it all so simple? Well, again, the, the nice thing about the medieval analogy is that it forces you to think about how complicated the world has been and will continue to be. It's not about China replacing America, East replacing the West, the Pacific replacing the Atlantic, all of these cliches that you simply shouldn't be allowed to get away with, quite frankly. Instead, realize that it's all of the above. It's all of those locations, all of those powers, all of those cultures at the same time, and its cities, its companies, its NGOs, its religious groups. Get used to that. Swallow that. Uh, uh, sort of uh, um, absorb that. Embrace it. That's the complexity of the new Middle Ages. And it's not something we're going to get out of anytime soon. So one of the things we learn if we look at... Um, medieval diplomacy is that it was overlapping, multi-layered, multi-actor, multi-issue, again, all of the things that are happening today. And authority was highly contested. Again, another feature of today's diplomatic system. Popes, lords, knights, merchants, uh, uh, mercenaries, again, all of these uh, were competing on the basis of what? What was the, what was the criteria for participation in diplomacy uh, in ancient medieval systems. And again, today, it was status, it was authority, it was recognition, it was prestige. Those are the prerequisites for being a participant in global diplomacy, not sovereignty, not state sovereignty. Again, diplomacy predates state sovereignty. Um, you know, in, in the book, I actually go through some of the other interesting parallels, such as the Silk Road era, the Crusades, uh, the fact that that was called the age of cathedrals, and now we have the age of skyscrapers. So some serious and some glib analogies between uh, between a thousand years ago and today. But uh, I don't want to stretch it too far. I just want to point to how it reveals the flaws in our thinking about uh, diplomacy, which again, are the focus on states and governments uh, alone. And the other psychological flaw in a way that it gives rise to is looking for silver bullets. Because if your institutional map of the world centers around the United States and Washington and the United Nations, well, then you're always going to say, well, how is America going to lead the world? How is Obama going to fix the world? How do we, let's take it to the UN Security Council, right? Ah, the G20 is the new steering committee for the world. How many times have you heard those phrases or even used them and really thought, that there is some silver bullet that we're going to find the way. They always fail, especially in such a complicated world. In fact, the tension between sort of chaos and order at the global level is really unprecedented. And the sense of hierarchy has long since really broken down. And whether it's left versus right, east, west, north, south, top down, bottom up, all of these things have been really thrown into, into flux. So instead of talking about a G20, uh, a friend of mine likes to say it's a G0. And that's where I think the world is right now. In other words, you know, the, the gridlock, we don't know what direction it's going to go. Uh, the resolution of the east-west gridlock that we have on issues like, like you know, economic management or human rights and sovereignty, uh, which economic consensus, the Washington consensus, Brussels consensus, Beijing consensus, Mumbai consensus, you hear all of these at the same time. So this fragmentation, according to states, actors, technologies, identities, all of this is a permanent feature, permanent meaning really for the next decades and centuries, a feature of um, our international or global diplomatic system. So that means we need to really rethink uh, diplomacy. Again, who, what, when, where, why, 
for this fast-changing world of perpetual uncertainty and crises that may accelerate. Uh, and in fact, you know, today a lot of people use this phrase, perfect storm. Uh, we have a crisis of scarce natural resources from the Arctic to Africa and competition over those resources, financial instability here in the United States, Greece, uh, Europe, all over. There's environmental stress, polluted oceans, drying up rivers, rising sea levels. There are the failing states. Most of the post-colonial world is in some way continues to be in a state of decay or fragmentation. All of these risks can, of course, amplify each other and create a chain, re chain reaction of systemic shocks. Uh, and you can imagine these uh, crises popping up in the coming years, whether it is tensions over uh, access to energy in the South China Sea leading to an escalation among Asian powers or what have you. So in this context, it's far too easy to simply say, well, it's about the return of the state. The financial crisis uh, ushered in this period in which large bailouts came from, from a number of major Western countries, uh, and therefore we are on a path again towards reestablishing or asserting the state system in a way that is going to lead to global stability. I think not. Uh, I think that, in fact, if the reason people talk about uh, China as being a role model to some extent in terms of its governance, although it isn't in some ways, to be sure, uh, but the reason they do so is because of the degree of public-private collaboration, collusion, we would pr certainly call it, uh, that exists there. The fact that public and private play uh, complementary roles in that system, and they do so in Europe as well in a way that uh, where one can say that it's uh, much more, much closer in a way to what our model is becoming. So really, rather than just talk about the return of the state, we should appreciate that there's many different kinds of states in the world. Very few states really have the kind of capacity to deliver the national stability that we are talking about and aspiring to. Um, and those are not even all the members of the G20. And not even all the members of the G20 are even systemically important enough to be called that. That term systemically important is interesting because, of course, it's part of what uh, was used to describe banks that were that are on the watch list and that have been bailed out. So there, there are private actors out there that are more systemically important than a great number of countries in the world. Because a lot of states are quasi-states or failed states. Some are just as likely to disappear off the map and collapse. And I wonder to what extent we should be focusing on simply state building for the sake of it versus looking at the kinds of hybrid sovereign and public-private governance models that I advocate in this book as a means to deliver the kind of uh, welfare and stability that we hope that these countries will achieve. And remember also that the state and the government are two different things, and it's increasingly important to make that distinction. Uh, there's interesting work around looking at how governments really are just one actor in the state and very often competing with others, and no, nece not necessarily any more legitimate, but certainly potentially just as corrupt as other actors. So really, when we talk about sovereignty today, we often find that we're just talking about a hybrid sovereignty. We're talking about ad hoc relationships between uh, governments and corporations that attempt to manage uh, resources, welfare, services, supply chains, and so forth. That, that's a much more accurate description of what's happening in, in a great deal of the world. And I would point to one word, parastatal. It's a word that you all know, but you don't hear all that much. But a lot of the new instruments of governments, governance that you see pop, popping up uh, that, again, are gaining currency and admiration and replication are these parastatal entities. Think Dubai, the Dubai International Financial Center. Think about special economic zones and the port zones like Jebel Ali, also in the UAE. These are all hybrid public-private types of ventures that are being replicated all over. They don't don't represent simply the return of the state. It's about partnerships that are being formed between domestic governments, foreign investors, domestic economic companies, and so forth. That's the kind of model that we're moving towards for all aspects of life. And so you'll find that in this book, you really won't hear much about um, the United Nations as a single entity based in New York, the core bodies, the UN Security Council, or uh, the General Assembly. I look much more at the functional agencies that are actually doing something, whether it's the World Food Program or, um, uh, or UNICEF and so forth, and the role that they play out in the real world. In fact, I do a little test sometimes just to point out how little inspirational power and centrality a lot of uh, you know, UN bodies uh, have in the world. Who can name a major World Health Organization program? Right? Not a lot of hands go up. How about the Gates Foundation? Ever heard of them? Yes. Uh, you know, how about uh, what, what was the main theme of the UN General Assembly last year or the year before? 
Okay, but who read about the Clinton Global Initiative? Ah, interesting, right? Just about everybody. Uh, who know who can name one or two principles from the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention? Hmm, who's heard of Transparency International? Ah, okay, so you're starting to get the point here. We have um, a lot of different actors competing around these functional issues. It's not just government agencies. It's not just international organizations that are responsible for implementing these normative agendas that we have. It's a little bit of everything. And this is, I don't make anti-statist arguments. I'm not anti-government. Uh, this, is, this is not, the argument is, in fact, that we have to accept this diversity of actors that are out there and that there are many contested claims to legitimacy and authority on these different issues, and that if we're going to succeed on a domestic level or an international level, it's going to involve including these actors, expanding the scope of diplomacy uh, to include them rather than excluding them and playing these either-or types of games. I'm much more of a both-and type of advocate rather than either-or. But to me, diplomacy has become this, the analogy being a massive multiplayer online game, MMOG, for all of you gamers out there. That's what diplomacy itself looks like. Instead of Model UN, I think students should be playing a, a global simulation in which when you sign up, you can uh, choose to be uh, Bono or Tom Friedman or Bill Gates, uh, in addition to being Ban Ki-moon or Barack Obama or something like that. And I think that would be much more reflective of, of the way diplomacy actually operates in the world today. And I do, you know, it's important to emphasize that you, all of these actors are out for themselves in the sense that they are all crafting their own foreign policies and not asking for permission necessarily from who we think of as the, the powers that be. Google certainly doesn't do it, although, of course, when they get in a bind, there's suddenly a much more intense dialogue with uh, the U.S. government. Uh, Halliburton does it. Boeing does it. Walmart does it. All of these companies have their own foreign policies. The Gates Foundation, uh, Oxfam, Médecins Sans Frontières, the Catholic Church, Hezbollah, and then cities, which are uh, not um, federal entities. But you find that Dubai, I mentioned earlier, London, uh, and other cities uh, really uh, you know, have their own diplomatic strategies, whether it's on the economic or the political level, even on security issues as well. Um, it's interesting, right here in this room, I think uh, you had uh, Zal Khalilzad once, and there was a great line from his talk uh, when you were talking about the future of diplomacy. He said, who is ambassador in the age of BlackBerry? And it seems to me that was very, very adequate or very apt way to capture this, uh, this sort of free-for-all that characterizes diplomacy today and that I want everyone to appreciate. So how do we reorganize diplomacy, though, for a world where everyone is doing whatever they want at, at scale? And what I'm trying to correct here is the diplomatic deficit in quotes. And everyone talks about the democracy deficit. International organizations aren't democratic. And then the conversation tends to stop because, in fact, there isn't really a mechanism as such for applying uh, uh, the type of democratic, domest the domestic analogy for how democracies operate uh, to the international level with respect to these institutions. But I'm more interested in correcting the diplomacy deficit, which is the lack of recognized participation of the many actors that do play an important role. And to me, the answer there is what I call in this book mega diplomacy, or some might call it wiki diplomacy. Wiki being such a popular prefix these days. And to me, wiki diplomacy or mega diplomacy is an architecture in which form follows function. We worry less about uh, about the form, meaning who you know, which uh, inter international agency takes the lead on something, and worry much more about the function. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And then we assemble the coalitions uh, to address it. And those coalitions are almost inevitably going to be, uh, or have participation from the .gov sector, the .com sector, the .org sector, the .net sector, the .edu sector. You'll find that these multi-stakeholder types of gatherings are proliferating uh, all over the world. And they bridge these, again, these public-private divides, this notion that there are inherently governmental tasks, whether it is security or healthcare or whatever the case may be. All over the world, you find that divide really breaking down, actually, and you find actors uh, coming together around them, even if they are not uh, state actors at all. And one of the other key principles is not only the inclusion of these actors into new coalitions, but to devolve resources as much as possible. I remember after the financial crisis, 
there were calls from people in the UN to create a vulnerability fund, a food fund, uh, this fund, that fund, put a couple of billion dollars or more in each one. And I asked myself, where is that money going to go? Why is someone in New York managing that money? Don't we know very well exactly where it should go into which agencies, which ministries, which resources on the ground uh, in Africa, in Asia, in the places that are vulnerable, in places where food prices have spiked? Wouldn't that be a better use of that money? And um, it's that that I'm trying to guard against, that notion that we should be centralizing resources. Instead, we should be devolving them and spitting them out to the actors closest to the problem on the ground. In other words, govern globally, but act locally. And to me, it's about empowering others, helping others help themselves. To me, that's the sort of, you know, should be the guiding uh, psychological principle in a way for global governance. And it often isn't. But today, because of the technology that we do have available, and the knowledge that can be shared through networks, uh, the structure of global governance can be so much more diffuse than the way we traditionally think about it. So let me just uh, just give a few examples, really, uh, so as I so I don't go on for too long. But I think you can apply mega diplomacy to every single fundamental functional sphere of our global system today. And just looking at the economic one, where, in fact, you know, the, the, the bailout in the United States, what was it called? It's called the Public Private Investment Program, PPIP. And as the global economy really isn't out of the woods just yet, we have to think much more about the kinds of public-private synergies that are going to be necessary to do the things that we want, which are to create jobs and to innovate. To create jobs and innovate, you need uh, private sector to create jobs, but you need government incentives. The two go hand in hand. And of course, the rhetoric uh, that has dominated here in Washington uh, versus New York, for example, has not really been characteristic of that. If you look at, for example, the, the financial industry, it's not really about re-regulating Wall Street down to the point where you know people can't make trades unless there is a, a, a supervisory body clearing it. But it's going to wind up being uh, some mixture of using the self regulatory industry mechanisms that do exist, but that need to be strengthened, like FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, together with the, 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 the federal regulatory agencies. And those FINRA, or like the American Bar Association, those are those are guilds, right? And in a way, uh, I'm reminded that it, um, or it's reminiscent of the Middle Ages, when professional guilds were so important in apprenticeship training and professionalizing workers. And I think that we need to you know, not throw the baby out with the bathwater and go overboard with regulation, but to think about how the actors that are closest to those that are making trades, those that are involved in economic activity, are being self-monitored as well as being regulated. Then I think, you know, getting to issues that are really uh, core to us here in, in, at the America Foundation and the American Strategy Program, issues of peace and security and conflict zones. Again, how do you look at issues like peacekeeping, for example, not from the top down, such as we need to strengthen uh, you know, DPKO in the United Nations and add more peacekeepers. Why? Why are we not focusing on providing much more manpower, training, support, and financing to regional security organizations, whether it's ECOWAS in West Africa, the African Union, which is currently active in everywhere from uh, in Somalia and Sudan? We should be putting much more. The U.S. government does, in fact. Uh, we do uh, provide a substantial amount of resources to the African Union, but much more emphasis on the international level needs to be put. Uh, on supporting regional peacekeeping groups rather than uh, those that whose deploy deployment is, quite frankly, contingent on UN Security Council approval, which is not always forthcoming, given the political paralysis there. If you look at a place like Afghanistan, what are the odds that we're going to get to uh, a sovereign, unified, um, uh, effective, uh, with strong capacity central government that's able to uh, provide the sort of security, uh, education, health care, and so forth for its people? How many years will it take? But what if we were to have a much better, much higher degree of cooperation among the aid agencies, uh, investors, extractive industry companies, service-oriented NGOs, and so forth, to team up and get, get these services delivered in a way um, that, that, that creates a new kind of network, again, public-private governance type of structure for the country. And I think that model is what we're going to eventually need, whether it's Yemen, Somalia, 
or other countries. And look, the best examples of what is working in Afghanistan do resemble this. Uh, the Afghan Solidar National Solidarity Program, which many of you heard of, uh, is an example of where donors give money directly to village councils who then decide on how it's spent. Uh, some of you may have seen in the newspapers this weekend the Department of Defense Task Force on Business and Stability Operations is bringing in American companies as much as possible to invest in local projects, hire locals, and so forth. So community building is as important as nation building, and building up those communities through public and private local means is exactly how it seems to be done right. If you look at some of the poorest countries in the world, landlocked countries in Africa, what is making the difference there is the building of infrastructure. And the private sector is heavily involved in the cross-border rail and airport, other types of uh, pipelines, other types of connections that are ultimately helping small landlocked countries connect to the global economy. And the list really goes on and on ways that... that um, uh, that we can use mega diplomacy to accomplish some of the headline goals that we have for the world. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight a couple more. I mean, uh, when we talk about good governance, does democracy promotion or talking about it really deliver it? Let me talk about instead uh, what I call functional activism, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So I mentioned Transparency International earlier. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of accountability, account or sustainability. These are two um, a sort of corporate NGO uh, actors based in the United Kingdom. And what they do is to embed themselves in the supply chains of companies and of, of government actors all over the developing world and help to implement uh, workers' rights, human rights standards, and, uh, and sustainability practices. They're really delivering on better governance uh, from the inside out and from the bottom up. Business for Social Responsibility, which is a relatively small NGO, they've increased the number of staff that they have in China to work on workplace rights and so forth by, by eight times. They now have 40 or 50 professionals doing this full time. And they have the kinds of access to Chinese companies that, in fact, uh, because of the high level political tension that there is uh, on human rights between the United States and China, uh, it's increasingly difficult for the U.S. government to actually do. So we not only are these actors doing a little bit of good here and a little bit of good there, they actually represent a different model for going about achieving the same ends. We need this mega diplomacy in some very, very uh, sensitive areas as well, such as uh, the resource curse, what to do about the energy rich, mineral rich countries uh, in Africa and elsewhere where we found that, of course, uh, we've talked about a resource curse where the fact that, that this wealth is present usually leads to uh, rent-seeking behavior, civil war, and, uh, and ultimately you know, negative growth rates in a lot of places. And this is where we find that some of the most promising uh, um, um, efforts that are out there, such as the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, uh, this was originally uh, conceived and funded by the Open Society Institute, but involves energy companies and it involves the World Bank. It's a very very complicated meshwork of players involved, and yet that those hold the most promise, such efforts hold the most promise to making sure that, that the oil wealth of, of these poor countries, often with despotic regimes, uh, is better managed than it has been right now. Remember that there's no point in keeping oil in the ground and saying there's bad FDI. There really is no such thing as bad FDI. There's just badly managed FDI, and mega diplomacy and schemes like this are the way to manage it better. It's, uh, there's a famous uh, sociologist, Ulrich Beck, he likes to say, the only thing worse than, than, the only thing worse than um, being overrun by multinationals is not being overrun by multinationals. Um, you know, there's a, you know when you, it's particularly when it comes to the poorest societies in the world, what I call in this book the orphan uh, states, where you find that already so much of the public, public service delivery is already done, in fact, by Western uh, NGOs and, and aid agencies. And they're operating in this fashion that is uh, already sort of, uh, you know, what I would call mega diplomacy. And in fact, they are the, the, the evidence of two things. First of all, this is already a rich field, already well underway, it used to be able to you know, maybe uh, count or quantify or even create a typology of the range of public-private coalitions that exist uh, in all of these areas. But now it's it's off the charts. So in fact, what we've needed is a theory to catch up with uh, with practice. And the other thing it's a reminder of is, again, 
that um, much of the post-colonial world, the poorer countries in the world, are still in this state of uh, fragmentation and decay where already this public-private hybrid governance in, in, in a messy, evolving, ad hoc fashion is already the order of the day. So rather than talk about the return of the state, for most of the world, you're really talking about the rise of some new kind of mega diplomacy that governs these countries. And of course, the work, again, of the Gates Foundation and others really does characterize this. And the environment is most certainly the clearest clearest area of all of this. Uh, how What has Kyoto, Copenhagen, uh, Cancun, what have they really accomplished versus the resources that have started to go into, but should all along have been going into, the kinds of technological innovations that corporations often do with government incentives and support that can then be deployed, uh, hopefully at, a, at an affordable cost, to the industrializing countries in Asia so that they could actually make the commitments that on the on the back end you might finally see in a place like Cancun or Copenhagen. No country is going to sign up to uh, mandatory caps on its emissions until they have the capacity, the technology to actually implement them. They don't get that uh, by going to these summits. They get it from companies. They get it from, from commerce and from trade and we need to focus on that level of innovation. And I think that if we apply this principle to all of these issues, yes, I'm talking about a, a fragmented world, a diffuse world, a world that some would consider anarchic, a world of greater divisions. But to me, it's actually a world in which you would have a greater division of labor uh, rather than just more divisions. It's the it's Durkheim's concept of the division of labor. And, uh, and Matt Ridley, who's written a great book recently called The Rational Optimist, he says he's optimistic about the world because it would be one in which everyone is working for everyone else. And I think that the combination of the fragmentation of this neo-medievalism but with the layer of technology and communication that we have today can create this much more diffuse but, but, uh, but um, uh, productive division of labor. And so the final point is, where does America stand in all of this? And this being the, the 50th anniversary of, the, of Eisenhower's military industrial complex speech, and our colleague uh, Bill Hartung has, has just written a book about this, I've been calling for what I call, uh, I've been calling for a diplomatic industrial complex. And of course, now it's a cliche that our military can win battles but not wars, and that we have to be negotiating with everyone. Um, but what I, when I talk about the diplomatic industrial complex, I'm talking, uh, what I'm pointing to is the fact that uh, as the United States as a society, not America, not the American government, but Americans, uh, this is the greatest pool of resources in one society that there is in terms of the wealth, uh, the innovation, uh, the, the, the economic strength, uh, the generosity of the civic sector, and so forth that exists in any one country. How are we organizing, not just our government, because then your answer is a very simple, oh, we need a whole of government approach and let's get all the agencies together. No, American society, who is developing an understanding of how we leverage those resources to actually confront the challenges that we face overseas? And that is what is absolutely necessary. And um, it's interesting that, you know, as you as I, as I travel around the world and, and whether I'm going to to American embassies or with other just talking to foreign uh, interlocutors, I often find that people are less interested in having official diplomatic visits than having CEO visits. And the State Department has actually caught on to this because they're organizing more and more technology delegations, uh, getting CEOs, getting investors to go overseas, look for opportunities, trying to encourage them uh, to invest in education, in uh, IT training, in factories, whatever the case may be around the world, because this is what foreign societies want. They want Americans, absolutely. They want American universities. Just look at um, uh, Georgetown, my alma mater, their campus in Doha, and those of many other universities that have sprung up around the Middle East, you don't find a ton of resistance uh, to those campuses being there. And they all sprung up in the last decade at a time when the level of animosity between the United States and the Arab world was at its absolute peak and remains to some extent there today. So I think we need to have much more of that. Um, ultimately, I'm pretty optimistic because I think that uh, Generation Y, Generation Z, even parts of Generation X uh, and others really get this concept of mega diplomacy. I think it's very intuitive to them. When you meet someone who works for the Gates Foundation or Google or running a corporate citizenship program or for the Clinton Initiative or Oxfam, I think they inherently understand that what they're doing is diplomatic. Anytime they, they cross a border and work on a program and negotiate with their foreign counterparts in the government or in business, they realize that they are fulfilling a diplomatic role. They are, they are, they are attacking a global public good challenge and function, irrespective of whether or not they are 
uh, a foreign service officer. And so I think that they uh, are the ones who really inherently understand interdependence and they inherently understand mega diplomacy. So uh, as, as Churchill said, I'm an optimist. I don't see much use in being anything else. Thanks very much. Um, Parag, let me uh, open the conversation a little bit. Um, and not play devil's advocate, but just sort of poke some, poke you a little bit, and, and then open the floor. My, my view, you know, I'm I'm I tend to be on the more realist side of things, and mm -hmm. I think that the notion that you have um, a system without controls, and so you're sort of painting a picture where there are lots of actors. Um, with different sources of legitimacy or perhaps no legitimacy at all in the role that they're playing. They're self-anointed kind of global do-gooders. Uh, and, that, and that the composite of all of those, nonetheless, uh, reflects something you're calling mega-diplomacy. And you've imbued this um, with some positive notions that their activity, their engagement abroad is automatically good uh, to some degree. And as I look at it, from a more resource-constrained, attention-constrained world that's lost the equilibrium that I think the Cold War gave it. So that states, because you, you fell back into talking about the UN and what the US funded, so you actually came back to talking about the US government uh, and what it did, even in the sort of headless world that you think we're moving into. That in that world, and I you know, admit that I'm not part of the global justice community that wants to see all these activities automatically do good in the world, because I don't believe there's enough resources to do it, so you need to make choices. Um, and then in that world, there may be things, if I was trying to ask myself, would there be a Chinese Parag Khanna saying this kind of thing to a Chinese audience about what China would be doing, or is China today, both at its corporate level, at its NGO level, and at its party control, national political level, thinking in both mercantile and deeply self-interested terms about what it's doing in Africa, what it's doing in Latin America, what role it may be doing in the UN. And I think the picture would be remarkably different than the, than the, than the one we're in today. So the question I'm trying to come to is, is the world you're describing really describing the wreckage, if you will, of the the slippage, the slipping of the American order and the failure to replace it with anything coherent. And in that anarchic situation, you have lots of people doing all sorts of things with no measure on what's productive or unproductive. But out of that, you've got other players. We were just down in Brazil and others who are moving in very self-interested forms. They're not committed to this global vision you just described, in my view. I don't think they're committed to mega diplomacy the way they are. I think they're committed to pursuing their own interests uh, while the U.S. flounders. And so I'm interested in how you respond to that. It's interesting questions. Um, in terms of resource-constrained world, you know, I am imbuing, I'm not imbuing the system with a sense of goodness, right, or a sense of purpose. Uh, what I am saying is, in fact, the, the power and the resources that are vested in all of these different actors that have come up actually demonstrates how, what a greater set of resources, capacities, human resources, talents, there are, in fact, available uh, to solve problems than simply in governments alone. You say it's an attention-constrained sort of system because you might be saying, just look at how much a Washington bureaucrat has to deal with. I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in his attention deficit disorder. I'm interested in the volume of resources that exist among NGOs, among businesses, among other governments, among aid agencies or, to solve a problem. So that, that's, that's number one. I think there's more resources than ever before that are on hand if we were to have more inclusive diplomatic coalitions to attack those problems. And I think that is um, undeniable truth. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having the debates that we have or, or, or recognizing the growing power of all these different groups. Some of them are quite nefarious. Terrorist groups, criminal actors, organized crime, they all have resources too. So I'm just talking about the entropy, in a way, that, that, it, that exists today. And from the, the, the Chinese angle, is interesting because I just read a, a lengthy report about how um, a set of universities and a group of NGOs have been consulting directly with Chinese corporations, obviously mostly state-owned, extractive, and so forth, 
in Africa, in Congo, Zambia, and other countries to uh, and, to, and to done a, a pretty thorough study of the impact of their supply chains on local conditions, whether it's workers' rights, um, uh, environmental sustainability, and so forth. They found that Chinese are moving up this learning curve in the same way that Western companies have, and they're maybe you know a half decade to a decade behind in that process, but learning quickly that because of local public pressure, local political pressure, uh, media monitoring, and the engagement with the with Western aid agencies or with local NGOs that are watching, they've actually learned very quickly uh, to not just go in and replaciously exploit resources in the self-interested fashion that, that you're saying that, that non-Western governments do as rising powers that are resource hungry, but in fact are acting according to these rules of mega diplomacy, which involve mutual monitoring and mutual accountability. And that's happening even by Chinese companies in Africa, the one place where most people in this town think that that's not happening at all. And it actually is. My comment, and I would like to move forward on, on China for the U.S. In, in, say, Africa or Chinese in, or Americans in Europe and uh, Africa, is that We've evolved from a period where we used to be the builders of dams and telecommunications infrastructure and roads, and we would go in and do this. And there was both a combined uh, purpose of development there connected to U.S. self-interest, tied to elites. China plays that function today. We do not. We approach development as a Sunday philanthrop philanthropic exercise. Uh, China jumps over those moral questions and is going and laying down the infrastructure and essentially doing deals with the new elites and whether it's through bribes or whatnot, 20 years from now, whatever you know, embryonic middle class exists are going to be tied to that world that China's created. And so I'm sure that in fact norms will develop, preferences will develop, mm -hmm. concern for quality of life will develop, but not according to rules we've set, according to rules that the Chinese pathway has sort of had, and, but, but what's driving them today is not to follow the leader of what the U.S. did. It's mm -hmm. to create networks that serve their interests. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're not driven by the concerns that Gates or mm -hmm. large NGOs and others have. We, I think we live in a very different world from 200, 300 years ago, the colonial era in which this kind of one-way street, and I think one-way street is, is not, not even, pardon the pun, because we're talking about infrastructure construction uh, development, really was meant to serve uh, that power that built it, whether it was a European colonial power or now China. Actually, we live in a world where already very early into China's presence in Africa, you can already see the, the backlash and the control mechanisms that are being put in place by certain countries to ensure that they will benefit as much as possible. They always have the power to say, thanks for this road, thanks for this railway, thanks for developing this mine, now get out at gunpoint. And that wasn't the case a couple of hundred years ago. And again, China has faced this backlash. It faces it every single day. The world is watching them. Everyone is watching them. They're learning this a lot faster than the French did and the British did. Uh, so yes, but I think your first point is the most important one. We used to be in the business of doing this large infrastructure type of stuff. And then we moved to a, a situation where uh, we and, and certainly the World Bank at times were saying, we're not just it's not going to get into infrastructure or extractive stuff anymore. It's too risky. It's too dangerous. Like I said earlier, it doesn't do anyone any good to leave the oil in the ground. It, all that you know, we should slap ourselves on the wrist, or I mean, we should be ashamed that because we are not developing the diplomatic instruments to actually manage those resources well, we're going to leave them there. To me, that that's absolutely shameful. And so China's come in, and as you know, it's been very welcome in building that infrastructure, because I think that's the greatest gift right now that, that countries can give to the underdeveloped, to the post-colonial world, whose infrastructure dates back to the colonial era and is in three to four generations of collapse now because it hasn't been renewed. So China has come in and renewed it. We should be doing that, or we should be doing it with them. Okay, let me open the floor. Uh, in the very back, is that Jack James? Um, I'd like to pick up where Steve uh, left off and ask you this question. Mr. Gates was just in China, and the Chinese were uh, taking out him and feasting him and dining him, and then at the same time they're running a stealth uh, plane uh, to indicate where the projection of force is going to be in the 21st century. India has, is, has got similar aims. I don't think you've addressed what Steve is pointing at, and that is the projection of force. Who has the authority to do that? There is still going to be an asymmetry. So if you're going to deal with a situation like Iran, or you're going to deal with a situation in Kosovo, or you're going to deal with any kind of burning bushes out there, who is going to marshal the forces and under what authority and legitimacy do you see that happening, if it's not the state? Mm -hmm. 
I, it's not a question of is it the state, but I think you're also saying which state. You're assuming that it would have to be the United States. And what I do uh, is spend a little bit of time in this book, particularly if you take the Middle East situation. Uh, you know, how far have we gotten really with uh, with sanctions policy on Iran or previously with uh, Syria, Cuba, other types of places? What I'm looking for is what is the stable, longer term diplomatic mechanism for a given region of the world, and d- is is does it is it founded on uh, American military? power projection? And is that really going to be the, the longer term factor uh, in the region that's going to actually stabilize? I don't think anyone would say that the fact that we have a, a preponderant military role in the Middle East today, or in East Asia necessarily makes it more stable. What I'm advocating, for example, in this book, uh, in with many different examples from Latin America to Africa and the Middle East, is regional security systems. I talked about regional peacekeeping forces earlier. We don't yet have a regional diplomatic mechanism, uh, which involves obviously security components in the Middle East that involves the key players, whether it's Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Israel, and so forth. In fact, it's the kind of instrument that some players in the region like Qatar, Bahrain, and others have proposed, and we have been opposed to. We've been pressured by Israel, we've been pressured by Saudi Arabia and others to stand in the way. But Steve and I have agreed in the past that mechanisms like the ASEAN Regional Forum and so forth have made some contribution towards improving transparency among players players in the region. So to me, the notion that, yes, the United States has a powerful military, yes, we project force around the world, yes, we can threaten and keep certain powers in line, all of that is true. To me, that still avoids the, the much more fundamental question, is it, which is, how, what is the longer term stable architecture for a region? And there is no region where the longer term, post-Cold War, stable architecture for a region is indefinite American military preponderance there. It's something that we can't afford, and it's something that's very often perce- equally perceived as stabilizing or destabilizing, depending on where in the world you're talking about. Um, Well, this will follow up on that. I'm Diane Perlman. I'm at the Institute of Conflict Analysis and Resolution at George Mason. And I'm also involved with Mediators Beyond Borders and Transcendent International um, Network of Conflict Transformation. So um, you're talking about security and, you know, projection of force. And sort of the paradigm around the world is, you know, has a lot to do with coercive measures. And even diplomacy is organized around coercion, sanctions, punishment. Um, And there's also a phenomenon around, you know, going on locally in a lot of different places where people are doing, um, working on the causes rather than suppressing the symptom of, of resolving conflicts. And there are you know, many activities in every region. Um, so how does, I mean, it seems that this fits in. And also, it's not exactly diplomacy, I don't think. So what's the question? Um, well, how does this play into your model sure. and also as an alternative, or, you know, hopefully to replace, you know, war and forms of force to resolve working on resolving underlying conflicts? Well, I mean, the short answer is that I have a whole chapter on these, um, you know, non-state mediation types of actors or a whole section on them, whether it is um, uh, International Center for Transitional Justice or Independent Diplomat, other types of groups that have been on the ground and mediating from the bottom up. Some call it track two diplomacy. There's other terms for it. I don't I don't I would never call it an alternative. Again, I'm not about either or types of approaches. I'm saying that all of them are important. I'm saying that if you only have a political negotiation that doesn't prepare a population population for peace, let's say in the Israeli-Palestinian situation, you still won't be there. So you need uh, that civic level as well as the political level. So I, I celebrate those activities. I know your center is certain, certainly researches them and is probably involved in some of them. Uh, and I think that they're just as important as what a lot of people would consider the real thing, which is what happens at the Rose Garden. Right uh, behind you, Jordan, this lady right here. Hi, I'm Rebecca McKinnon. I'm a oh, fellow here. I can't see. We're oh. blinded up here. You want so, me to No, no, it's okay. Stand I still up? can't okay. see you. It's just uh, All right. we're just I'm, blind. Yeah, Let's no see. problem. Um, since you're talking about China, um, I'd, also, I'd like to bring it back to China a little bit, particularly as regards civil society. Um, the Chinese government just a couple days ago actually banned the use of the phrase civil society in news reports in China. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I was in China just in, in November. I was, one of the things I was going to be doing was... Aren't you the civil society diva in yeah, China? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. I, you That's know, why I, she's I, here, I, I not tried, in China. I, I, <laughs> How I did the Chinese be, now describe I, what you're doing? <laughs> well, I was, I, when I was in China, Trouble. the main reason for going there was to attend a, a meeting of bloggers who wanted to talk about how to use technology so that citizens can solve 
social and economic problems. You know, not about overthrowing the government, but just, you know, how to use technology to solve problems. Um, and they were shut down. The police wouldn't let them even meet. So uh, civil society, in, not only in China, but in quite a lot of countries, um, is, is having trouble uh, really uh, coming into its own, um, you know, really, really participating fully. And I've, I've been involved in a number of multi-stakeholder, both initiatives globally and also you know, more multi-stakeholder gatherings where civil society groups from all around the world attend. And of course, you know, the India, Philippines, and so on, you have a very forceful presence. Uh, and then there's a group of other countries uh, with, with very, you know, kind of government organized NGOs, but you don't have a vibrant civil society participation globally from those countries. And I wonder if, if you have any thoughts about the extent to which by stifling civil society, particularly in this more multi-stakeholder world that we have now, um, countries are really hurting their own interests um, in, in the broader sense because they're, they're stifling their own ability to, to really unleash their own citizens right. and solving a lot of, of problems yeah. that their, their countries face, not only yeah. domestically but, but also internationally yeah. to, act, to act as advocates. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, it's, it's well known that in the Arab world, for example, where there is a substantial suppression of civil society, yes, of course, they're hurting their own interests in terms of a flourishing of entrepreneurialism, women's rights, education, all of these other public goods that they would be better off having than not having, most likely, and, and of course, it as a result of political persecution. The difference between those countries and China is that at least the Chinese state is attempting in some way, shape, or form to deliver social welfare to its population uh, in, uh, in its own way uh, and doesn't want the competition politically or otherwise from these uh, civil society entities. And in this book, when I talk about this transnational civil society that is that some people call a superpower of its own, I don't use rhetoric like that, but I'm obviously talking about those Western-based uh, large transnational NGOs that have sufficient independent non-governmental funding that they can again, set their own course, set their own policy, act wherever they choose to, and, uh, and have, a, have a presence around the world. And there is a growing number of them. It, it's, it's, you know, it, it's more than just one or two. And so I'm talking about those. The fact that there isn't um, a Chinese, an exported Chinese civil society the way there's Chinese state-owned companies ap operating around the world is, I suppose, uh, you know, something that, that is by design because if, as they suppress domestic civil society in these areas, they're also preventing, uh, you know, the internationalization of it, except for things that they want, like uh, the Confucius Institutes, of course, right, which are sort of, you know, hybrid governmental types of entities that are promoting uh, Chinese culture. But um, I think you have to take the societies one at a time. I just think the first distinction that I made between what goes wrong when Arab countries do what you're describing versus what China does are, are, are two different stories. So we would take them one by one. I, I disagree. I mean, I see China fairly well exporting the, the, at least the software ideas of how developing states with authoritarian regimes can grow. And I look at that as an important command and control governance function, which China's model is exporting today. Uh, and I would say it's making much more ground today than the U.S. model uh, or any of the uh, kind of Western European yeah. models. And I think that from where Re the point of view where Rebecca comes in, I, I think that's, for the kind of concerns you have, deeply concerning, not only about what China may be involving, but how that may, in fact, spread virally in, into many other communities. And it's very tough, because when you look at a place like Cuba, which I've gotten to know pretty well, to a certain degree, you say that China model would be a big step forward for Cuba. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, enormous. Yeah. So let it happen. Because you think that that may take you closer to what might bring you to the opportunities where uh, technology or participation in public fora on these other things may be around the corner. But I don't think it's a, you know, I don't think that it's a given. And I, but I, I think, it, I just wanted to interject, I don't think it, it's, a, it's correct to think that China's model isn't a deeply compelling mm 
force today in the world. No, of course it is, Steve. As you know, I wrote my entire last book about it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm no stranger to Chinese grand strategy and the ways in which uh, both governmental and non-governmental, they export their model and, and how the Chinese model is rhetorically deployed in different parts of the world. And it is deployed in different ways with different meanings, whether it's in Latin America, Africa, or other parts of Asia. What I do find in common, though, is that almost none of those countries have anything like the discipline of China. So there's a big difference between those who talk about the Chinese model and that viral, compelling sort of, you know, notion that it is as it hangs in the air versus actually doing it. And when it comes to actually doing it, only China does the China model. Uh, even even Vietnam, which is considered the little China, is having a lot of problems in doing things the, the Chinese way. What I think is much more realistic, though, in terms of what we should aspire to is um, is something that I neglected a great deal, uh, you know, tr neglected full stop in my last book, which was the India model. And the India model is a much more chaotic, hybrid, public-private type of notion because it is a free society. You do have a tremendous amount of participation of companies, of NGOs, of uh, industry groups, of diasporas and remittances, and this experimental model of, of development that is taking place at all levels of India, from the top-down uh, degree of partnership that exists between the industrial uh, entities and the government and the planning commission to set infrastructure policy, to the bottom level of NGOs, grassroots, uh, and communal level types of mechanisms. All of that is happening in this public-private hybrid mixed-up kind of fashion. That That is actually much more representative of what is happening in many parts of the world, including in, in many parts of Africa. In fact, this uh, uh, it, it really is a function of, of how free and open a society is rather than whether or not the leadership is obsessed with the notion of a China model. Jeff Stacey. Uh, Jeff Stacey from the State Department speaking here in a private, not a public capacity. Uh, Parag, um, several quick questions. Uh, would your book get published by University Press, could it? Could your ideas be subjected to a rigorous social scientific analysis? In other words, I'm trying to figure out what we can hang our hat on here. Um, can you advance an argument with evidence across the board that would suggest what states should do to navigate in this new world that you compare to the Middle Ages? Um, what precisely do you want us to do? and how to do it. Is it about filling unstable, insecure spaces in a new way? Is it, but does that slip into um, poverty, um, promotes terrorism sort of ideas? Um, can you give us something to hang our head on? Kyle? Sure. What, what I do in this book, actually, and, and this is tied uh, in some ways to, to my dissertation, so there is some social scientific background to it, but what I did in that, in that work, um, you know, and which is referred to here, is that creating a typology of, of diplomatic modes, public-public, which is the world that you live in in the State Department, by and large, in terms of bilateral, multilateral, interstate diplomacy, uh, public-private diplomacy, which is uh, one bit of which I... I took much more of a chunk of today's talk from because they're examples that you're very, very familiar with. When you hear about public-private partnerships, uh, it's become a cliche practically. Um, and then there's also private-private diplomacy, uh, the relationships among private actors uh, that in some way constitute and contribute to global governance. And one very recent uh, but prominent example of that is the relationship between Walmart and the Environmental Defense Fund. So these are two private actors, one corporate, one NGO, that have teamed up to green Walmart supply chain. And you've probably all heard about this and read it in the news. That's a private-private uh, relationship. So these three sets of diplomatic activities, uh, to me, in together constitute perhaps the sum total of diplomacy. If you're looking to quantify them, I say that they have to can only be quantified on a functional basis. What is the issue basis uh, on which you're looking? And there are going to be certain areas like obviously military activity and so forth in which you're going to find a far greater amount of of uh, public public uh, components and then there's going to be others such as uh, health care for example where you're going to find a lot more uh, public private types of relations to me if you want to hang your hat on something i think that is a, a an interesting framework to use to evaluate uh, what activities are going on to quantify them, to measure them. But, I'm, but what I'm saying is that it's changing a great deal. It, it's, it's in flux. But I think that it's a more a neutral and appropriate way to look at the, the sort of sum total of activities in a, given, in a given issue than to simply assume that we lead with uh, the intergovernmental process and we assume that everything else is just a, is just a sort of peripheral dialogue. Chris Tucker. 
My name is Chris Tucker, what Steve uh, earlier called a global self-appointed do-gooder. Um, uh, I got an early copy of the book so I can attest it's worth buying and you should buy it and read it. Um, but a theme in the book that you didn't touch upon much was what you several times referred to as cartographic fictions, mm -hmm. um, specifically, you know, the borders that represent state, what we kind of call states, but I think what today's talk um, betrayed was, you know, in your opinion, a lot of them shouldn't really be considered states. And uh, I think one of the phrases that I, if I get it right, um, you kind of said there's a lot of nations, you know, seeking to be states, but they're trapped within these states, grossly unstable, far too large, Sudan, mm -hmm. Congo, you know, we can go down a long list of these that also happen to be a lot of our geopolitical hotspots. Can you talk a bit about those cartographic uh, fictions and kind of what do we do about that? And we as the global Catholic we, you know, what, right. how, how should we tackle that as a, as a global community? Yeah, and, and Sudan provides a great uh, sort of impetus to, to talk about that. You know, rather than talk about cartographic fictions, what I, the term I use in the book is cartographic stress. And that points to the fact that borders still matter a great deal. We still fight a lot about border, over borders. We compete over borders. Borders justify some component of the military industrial complex around the world. What would we do about uh, transcending that? And that would require dealing with this cartographic stress. And so the way I approach it is to first say that we have, um, you know, put a bit too much stock, of course, in the, in, the, in the map of the world as it is today. I point out how every single year there are uh, changes on the map, whether it is border adjustments or whether it is changes that result from climatological kinds of uh, phenomena. And we need to take examples like Sudan and be uh, you know, much less averse. And I think this represents a br Sudan represents a breakthrough example of how, because there has been so much diplomatic glue, both, again, official from the U.S. side, from the U.N. side, but also through non-state actors, um, involved in trying to make the birth of South Sudan a peaceful occurrence that it may potentially give uh, cartographic adjustments and new state birth where it may be needed, Palestine, Kurdistan, and other places, uh, a better name. Uh, so first and foremost, I think that 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 uh, that Sudan is a real pivotal test case because it, it might hopefully demonstrate that we can allow certain nations to become states uh, and, and pursue and enable self-determination in that Wilsonian sense and go back to that without it necessarily leading to uh, a tremendous amount of bloodshed. And I do think that then would ultimately diminish um, the um, uh, the amount of, of interstate political violence that there is in the world. And of course, no one can argue that the European Union is the foremost example of that. And one of the neglected elements of it is the role of infrastructure, is once states you know, are able to separate, they then are more likely to to trade and form e economic commercial uh, bonds with each other. Uh, we strongly support the, the notion of the arc, uh, such that uh, the Palestinian state could be a, a sort of a, a sovereign, economically viable entity. And if and when there is that Palestinian state, it could have um, uh, friendly trade commercial relations with Israel. And I think that infrastructure between Kurdistan and Turkey, for example, and the rest of Iraq uh, could be another example in that regard. So I think that two things, self-determination first and then infrastructural connections second, or both at the same time, are the right way to deal with uh, some of these situations of cartographic stress. All right here, front. We're going to do the front and then the very back. Uh, Rafael De Janeiro with True North Projects. I like a lot of what you say. Do you have a chapter on the U.S. or an opinion on the question, who should run the United States? <laughs> um, I'm probably one of the many Americans who feels, for example, that big banks have too much power in Washington. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. I mean, I talked earlier about that that particular slice of the issue in terms of who runs the United States when it comes to uh, taking advantage of the fact that there are professional uh, institutions uh, on Wall Street and others that, that probably need to have more internal monitoring kind of capacities, but still need to report in a more 
um, sort of regulated way uh, to to the government, and that that kind of again public private harmonization is going to be the right way to go about this. When it comes to, I talked also about job creation, and one of the examples I use in the book is the sort of nineteenth century charter companies in the United States. So the kind of infrastructure renewal that people have been advocating, I certainly have for years as well. That the United States needs isn't necessarily going to come only from big government spending, especially since Congress doesn't seem to be in the mood for it. But if the right incentives are in place, you could find a corporate support for those kinds of investments. Already in the city of Detroit, uh, the owner of the Red Wings and the CEO of the Penske Corporation have contributed to funding a downtown mass transit rail system for the country. So again, public-private uh, examples really abound in this country as well. And the, the Kaufman Foundation that did this major study of how to promote entrepreneurship and resurrect the U.S. economy have pointed as well to many kinds of public-private instruments. The National Infrastructure Bank uh, that is being proposed now, uh, one of our former colleagues is working on that on the Hill, uh, also looks at, again, getting more private sector support and investment into the things that we're doing. So I think your, your question may be much more you know, narrow and philosophical in terms of what regulatory environment are we looking for. And to me, again, it certainly shouldn't be one that squeezes out the very players that are going to be necessary to get America running right again. Brock, thank you. This is uh, I'm Rob Dubois. I'm a uh, applied smart power security advisor. And uh, Steve's first question you answered. I think you mentioned uh, that it's not necessary for altruism to drive every effort that's going on globally to have some benefit come out of it. Um, if I got that right, I wanted to uh, tag on to the last question, which was uh, who runs it in the U.S. My question is, do you recommend that we have some kind of a non-authoritative sort of advisor? Uh, a mega diplomacy czar for the U.S. to look at least speak to these disconnects. There are so many resources, as you mentioned, that could be tapped if they were they're existing today. They're not being used or leveraged. Yeah, I mean, we were supposed to have one. Uh, Secretary Clinton appointed such a person to oversee public-private relations. But in fact, you know, in an office so small such as what was created, you can only have a limited sort of bandwidth in terms of capturing again the 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 role of um, of such such different American actors, whether it's Hollywood and Coca Cola and and uh, and General Motors around the world. So I don't think that we will ever be able to lock it down, you know, in in a static sense. But yes, do I think that that uh, I mean the three step process that that I recommend in this book, um, which I should have uh, mentioned earlier, in fact, uh, was is that you know those officials in in the U.S. government working on this should be first thinking about the interagency process as they do this whole of government sort of thing. Then there's uh, Anne Marie Slaughter's term, the multi partner sort of approach, which is what are international uh, governments, allies of the United States, already doing vis a vis a given issue. When we talk about, say, for example. Uh, North African governments and, and economic growth and stability there, uh, there's this notion that, oh, okay, we've got some special ops guys across North Africa working in the Sahel on counterterrorism. Okay, it's calm. Please. The reason North Africa is whatever degree of stability it has today is because of the engagement of the European Union. It's because the massive amounts of foreign investment, infrastructure spending, job creation, political dialogue that European governments have had with those countries going back decades it's in, in, throughout the post-colonial period. Whatever we do is an add-on to that. So always remember or think about what others are doing. This is where China-Africa is important. The f fate of Africa is not being determined by what U.S. foreign policy is. I'm sorry. It's being determined by what China does, what we do, what Europeans do, what lots of players do. So always have your mind open to that. Again, so whole of government, multi-partner. And then the third is the public-private. Right. What are American private actors doing? What is the Gates Foundation doing? What are what sister cities programs doing? You name it. What are American actors doing, philanthropists, charities, corporations, so forth, vis-a-vis -vis that issue? And then try and assemble that coalition from an American standpoint to, to affect the issue. So to me, it's a three-step checklist that, that our policymakers should go through. And then they might come up with a more, a better, certainly better informed and certainly more resourceful policy towards uh, these issues. Yes, right here, very quickly. You've got to wait for the mic, David. David Fishman, visiting scholar Johns Hopkins Science. Let me touch on a question raised over on the front there before. Does your book address questions of national identity? And I'll give you three examples. The U.S. national identity, how does, how does the American majority in Congress and in the public perceive themselves in terms of the dimension you're 
presenting. Similarly, China, I was at a presentation at CSIS yesterday where the consensus was that the Chinese people are more in favor of what Steve described as the Chinese model than their government, in other words, nationalism. And thirdly, take a case like Pakistan. What is the Pakistani identity? What is the Turkish identity? What is the Iranian identity? How do these questions fit into the uh, overall picture you're presenting? No, identity is very important in a way that's even more fundamental than I think you're describing, which is that people are can choose to have one or multiple identities today. Your national identity isn't your only identity. I meet a lot of young people who, who want to talk about their corporate identity and the fact that they feel like members of a transnational business uh, class, and they almost regret the citizenship that they hold because they come from emerging markets and don't have uh, immediate visa-free access to the Western world. So I think the much deeper issue of identity, you're, you're pointing to very traditional, but not really necessarily a deep uh, you know, way of approaching identity because it can be many different uh, things. So the U.S. identity, U.S. mainstream, if anyone knows exactly what that is today, please let me know because I don't. Um, but uh, so, yes, is there nationalism, though, to, to address your question? Um, Directly, yes, there is there is nationalism in, in many countries in the world. There are there are strains of U.S. nationalism, Chinese nationalism, certainly uh, on the rise. Uh, it's something I, I've tracked in, in in my earlier work as well. Uh, but how that plays out in foreign policy again really depends on on different issues. Uh, do Chinese defend what their you know their activities? around the world, such as saying, you know, we need to have a robust military or we need to send our navy further afield into into blue waters or our investments in Africa are having a better payoff than what America is doing. Yes, there's there's nationalism around some things that they do. There's also shame around some things they do. There's you'll meet many Chinese who are who are uh, very disappointed uh, in their government's handling of the Nobel Prize, for example. So I don't see any one answer in any of this much as I don't for the United States and Pakistan, you know, to take just, I mean, is one of many examples of the fragmentation of identity that's occurring, again, across the post-colonial world, which is so much a focus in this book, because most of the world is the post-colonial world. Most of the world's population is in post-colonial countries. Most of the countries in the world are post-colonial. So when we say the world, the state, really, you know, if you're generalizing about it and assuming that the state is strong, you're not looking at the same world I'm looking at. I'm looking at when, you know, when you talk about identity, and I do, it's the fragmentation and the, the seizure of new identities, whether it is sub-state, regional, ethnic, but also technologically driven, corporate driven, identity or cause driven um, uh, it, all over the world, uh, most certainly in, um, in, in the developing world. And then again, as I mentioned towards the very end about uh, the next generation, I think the generational identity is something that is increasingly uh, powerful and potentially uh, quite positive and transcends nationalism, of course, in many ways. Thank you, Parag. Just in you know, closing, um, I want to give people an opportunity to talk to Parag, and we've got his books here. Uh, for those interested, wish those online could also get them. Uh, there, there should be an Amazon link there somewhere. There is. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm very intrigued. I mean, your book is very thought provoking, and as I, you know, I tend to think about states. Most of you who know me know that, but I've been opening my mind a little bit to this, to these other questions, and and. From uh, Prague and I have traveled to Brazil and have, have seen various initiatives that Brazilians are taking, or I've gotten very involved recently with two NGOs, one uh, called MEDIC, I think it's M-E-D-I-C-C, -C, don't ask me what the acronym is for, but uh, it's a healthcare-oriented NGO that works a lot in Cuba. Uh, and in Cuba, you see you know, some of these questions from their perspective. If you drop any notion that you're looking through an American portal, let's say through the Cuban portal, and the fact that they sent this Henry Reeves Brigade of doctors to Pakistan after the Kashmir earthquake uh, and, and look at that. It comes much closer. I'm able to think about the terms you're describing much more easily in those contexts. Or uh, today is the one-year anniversary of the Haiti earthquake, uh, a group called Fancose, which Nick Kristof uh, wrote about uh, a week ago and, you know, is a microfinance operation that has reached uh, 200 and some odd thousand people in a, in a very bleak, awful year in, in uh, Haiti, nonetheless, has achieved um, important things. And I have to tell you, uh, very, very little real government uh, support from any government there. So it's one of the areas in which where NGOs are actually uh, calling many more of the shots in terms of the backbone of whatever networks continue to exist in Haiti. So it's interesting. Um, so I'm fascinated, intrigued, congratulate you very much. I want to thank you very much for spending time with thank us. You. Encourage people to get the book and read it, and we'll talk afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye.